This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans, welcome to another installment of the Boston Wrestling Sports Special Wrestling Insider Podcast Edition, where we discuss the latest news, history, and memories on the greatest form of action and excitement across all forms of sports and entertainment when it's done right. I'm Dan Marotti, happy to be joined by... Mr. USA 2000, I mean, yeah, 2006 WWE Hall of Famer, Tony Atlas. Tony, you're almost having a Joe Biden moment over there. You forgot what century it was for a second. Th that ain't new for me. That, you know what? You're very right. You're very right. You know what Ernie, you know what Ernie the Cat Lad would uh, say to Tony Atlas? I'm sure you're going to tell us. What did, what did Ernie Ladd used to say? He said, not Tony Atlas, hey, if, if a bird had his brain, he would fly backwards. Hey, if, 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 his, if his IQ was one point less, he'd be a banana. Well, I don't think Ernie was too far off, but that's a different story for a different time. Tony, before... Ernie Ladd, Ernie Ladd, now, before we get off of that. All right, all right. Ernie Ladd was loved, respected by every wrestler, football player that ever met him. Ernie was a big man, great big man, had gigantic hands, and and uh, Ernie would tell you, I'm the best. I'm the best. And in, in, in many ways, he worked because Ernie was a guy that did his job. Let's say, for example, I'm wrestling Ernie Ladd. Yeah. Even though he's six foot nine, 6'10", 310 pounds, and at the time, I was only 6'2", and 250. Ernie, if the promoters say, Ernie, we need to get this kid over. Ernie would do everything in his power to get me over. See, Ernie was a businessman. Yeah. See, see, Ernie was, was, didn't have an ego. He wasn't in it for himself. Ernie would make you look good. And then if they say, Ernie, we want you over, Ernie would make you look bad. But whatever, he never had any problem. In fact, Ernie Ladd was the guy that got me into the WWF back with Vince Senior. The Vince Senior, because Ernie, every time we went to New York, he talked to Vince about me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vince McMahon, I remember Vince McMahon Senior, my first day, my first day to, to meet him, he said, a lot of people are going to take responsibility for you being here, Tony. He said, but I want you to know that Ernie Ladd uh, is the one that got you here. And sadly, I was in Charlotte uh, back in the Nannies, I believe it was, but they used to have the uh, the Fan Fest. Mm -hmm. And Ernie was, he had cancer, and he was dying for cancer. He became a, a minister and gave his life to God. And me and him, we sat and, 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 and talked uh, at breakfast at a hotel. And he could barely walk at the time. He was in a wheelchair. And uh, he asked me to give him some food. I got him some of uh, my stuff. He couldn't eat certain stuff, you know. And uh, he looked at me. He said, uh, what happened with you and them people? And so I told him the story about, uh, uh, you know, me and, and, and our, our Vince. And uh, he said, well, I'll talk to him for you. And then about a year later, that's when I got called, a couple of years later, that's when I got called to do that thing in 1997 where they were going to do something with The Rock. Oh, wow. Well, Ernie but continued Ernie, to look Ernie, after you. Right. He, they had the Vince Sr. and Jr., had that type of respect for Ernie Ladd. And another story that, that I, I never forgot, uh, Bill Watts, he told me he was the most radical person you ever want to meet. The most me, what? Radical. Radical? radical? But, yeah, but, oh, okay. but it, it, it was his way of saying racist. Oh, all right. Well. You see, a lot of them guys, and you hear me say this before, a lot of the rest of was member of the KKK. See, the KKK, is looked down upon now. Mm -hmm. But in 1960, they was probably the second largest political party in America in the 60s. It was almost a badge of honor to be part of the KKK in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it was, especially during that time. Because black people to white America during that period of time was like terrorists. Yeah. Or, or, or you know, like 
they did not one of us. You know, if, so you know, this was all right at the beginning. And Bill Watts told me I was riding with him one day. He said I was used to be the most one of the most radical people you ever want to meet, Tony, when it come to black people. And I, you know, I, I, I said, "Why?" Well, I didn't get mad at Bill. I felt good that he's telling me this. You know, oh my God, thank Bill you. Bill was honest yeah. about his racism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but well, that's how I wrestled. Well, that's how we got along. We didn't. Uh, we didn't have to agree with your uh, opinion or, or, or your belief, mm -hmm. but we had to respect it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, so he was telling me this, and he said, if it wasn't for Ernie Ladd, Ernie Ladd, he said, I probably would still be the same. Ernie opened his eyes to the world. Yeah, and Bill was the one that told me about Dusty, that Dusty was racist. I never believed it because Dusty was always cool with me. You know, mm -hmm. he never, but, but 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 he told me many a time, he said, Dusty, you know, a Mulligan, Dusty, Rick Flair, all these guys, the guy, Paul Jones, and it was all, you know, uh, in fact, one of the guys admitted it to me. He told me the names of people, and Murdoch told me, he said, Tony, you don't have to worry about me because you know my belief. You know how I feel. He said, but it's the guys that you have to worry about, the guy that, that sleep in the same room with you, eat, you know, eat out the same plate, and probably screw the same bra that you screw, that attend more clans meetings than I do. In other words, Murdoch was telling me, I'm not the only one kid. So it was almost like it was a KKKK. It was the, the kayfabe Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, That's what you see, needed but, to worry about. Yeah, but and I yeah. asked George Tuton Harris one time. How what did George Harris say? Did, how, and this is what he said. Right. He said to get him out of speeding tickets. What got him out of speeding tickets? The, having a, cl a clan car. A really? KKK car. He'd show yeah. the police KKK yeah. membership cards and he'd get out of speeding tickets. Yes, in North Carolina at that time. North wow. Carolina, North well. Carolina. That's right, during the 70s, that's right. Well, you know what, Tony? I think that would be a good place for us maybe to start. Uh, the fans don't know it yet, but we discussed over the weekend that in these quiet times to try and keep our minds active and try and keep interest on all of the projects we're working on, we, we're going to attempt to put together a, a non-wrestling-related uh, Tony Atlas Current Events news show later this week. So maybe that would be a good topic to throw in then. I think that oh, yeah. the fans' yeah. ears might be open. It'll have nothing to do with wrestling. Uh, and we're going to try and keep the wrestling shows more wrestling orientated. So I think that that might be a good place to start later in the week, yeah. Tony. But, but but this is about wrestling. Give people an insight of how the old Tamas yeah. made it. Well, I, really I, like, I agree. Yeah, we was there at the beginning, right. like the 70s and stuff. Just like a Frank, a, a, a Frank Goodis, Bruiser Brody, you know, he's a big Jewish kid, superstar of, of, of Billy Graham. And then it was a melting pot of the for wrestling up here in the Northeast because yeah. they – you had to deal with all type of different uh, uh, big, uh, 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 religions, yeah. different culture, different. And that's the thing that about wrestling that was so amazing to me all through the 70s and the 80s. Today, it would seem like normalcy. But like you take like during the 70s, when you got all these different types of, you got Catholics, you got Jews, you got uh, 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 a Muslim, you you got uh, all these different religions, and then you got all these different people, and a lot of these people are from different countries all together, like they, Nikolai Volkov, the Aaron Sheep, you know. And they you weren't a lot of places. Uh, too. They weren't a lot of places outside of professional wrestling where you'd see a mix of that type of uh, different ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. And, and I learned so much because when you respect a person's belief. And mm -hmm. opinion. When you show respect to a person's belief and opinion, what I learned from George Scott and everybody, they will respect your belief and, and, and right. So you could talk very openly. Yeah. All right, Tony. Well, we got to get down to the matter at hand. Again, I'm looking forward to these uh, programs we're going to produce with the thoughts of the world in your mind. We're going to talk a little bit of wrestling today before we get down to business, Tony. We want to continue to let fans. Uh, promoters around the world know that even during these crazy times, the Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas is available for personal appearances, birthday parties, commissioned artwork, your artwork is outstanding, personal phone calls, uh, autographs, all that great stuff. You can reach out to us uh, at the email address below. We want to keep Tony working. He's been crushed by the pandemic going on. The wrestling bookings have dried up. Uh, even the job as a personal trainer has dried up. So we're going to get Tony 
moving. We also want to send a shout out, Tony, to a friend of ours, Leo Rush, the former WWE Cruiserweight champion who was released a few weeks ago during that mass exodus of talent and agents. He released his first album today, Tony, called Ever After. You can download it at musicbyleo.com. I enjoyed it a great deal. Tony, if you knew how to download something, I'd suggest you listen to it. He's, he's done a fantastic job outside of the auspices of wrestling, and I think that's good for him because every skill that any of these talents that have been released have is good for them to be able to fall back on to try and make money. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, when we come to this, you know, you know, oh, you you know sometimes when people talk to me, uh, my brain is weird. Yeah, I've learned I that. I got a weird brain. I've learned There's that. People, everybody that ever met me probably understand that anyway, but, 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 but I'm, I'm a weird guy. As you was talking, mm -hmm. guess who popped into my head? And don't bring up Teddy Banner, please. Johnny uh, Weaver. Johnny Weaver. Why did Johnny Weaver pop into your mind when we were talking about Leo Rush's rap, al rap album that back dropped today? Back in the 70s. When guys, Johnny liked rap? When, when, when all, back no. in the 70s, all right. when, when guys were starting making $100,000, $150,000 a year, I yeah. give, give the credit to George Scott and Rick Flair. If Johnny Valentine set the territory on fire, but right, at the, the right when the territory was getting ready to pop, you know, right when everything was getting ready to break loose, uh, Johnny Valentine, unfortunately, was in a, a plane accident right. uh, in Wilmington, uh, uh, North Carolina. Uh, and so Rick Flair stepped into Johnny Valentine's boots. They didn't believe he could carry him and Wahoo McDaniel. They set the frick in place on, on fire. But anyway, they had these investors coming along. Mm. And I remember one story where, the, where this investor came along and were talking to the wrestlers about investing in these uh they were the franchises now mm -hmm. they were selling franchises and one of the wrestlers one of the old guys from out of the sixties somewhere he was probably in his fifties at the time he said that's all the only thing we need is another damn hamburger joint so the guys started laughing and everything about it and we would say I I should have I should have got that. He said the biggest problem with wrestlers while they're making money that they're not thinking about the money that they could have been making outside of wrestling. Mm -hmm. He said, I should have bought in, in that. He's on the why I let the guys talk me out of it. He was pissed about it. I'll say about a, a year or two later, I found out who the people were. Who were they, Tony? McDonald's. Well, I tell you this, Johnny, maybe he wouldn't have been so angry and had to take it out on Penny if he got the McDonald's oh, franchise. I mean, I mean but, but he had that uh, hit. And you know, the first guy, a lot of guys did do it. Like, and just like a lot of people do, uh, don't know another guy that was doing it. It was a lot of guys that was thinking like that. Because they, they, they came out of the 50s, the 60s, and this is the 70s, and they're always in the 50s and 60s themselves. Yeah. They were looking at retirement. Right. So that's why when I roll with these older guys, these guys were trying, like Ernie Ladd, was, uh, that told me something that going back to Ernie Ladd that was amazing, and I wish I had done it. He said, pay yourself 10%. He said, think about it, Tony. When you get $100, he said, you pay your, your, all your bills, you pay this, you pay that. The only one that don't get paid out at $100 is you. He said, take 10% uh, of everything you make, put it in a bank away from you, and don't touch it for about for the next 50 years or 40 years. And you wish you did it. He said, if you get $100 and you put away $10, he said, you're not going to miss that $10 because the only $10, you're not going to go back and get it. If you try to save $50 or $40, something going to pop up, you're going to go, go back to get it. But $10, you, it's not worth the effort for you to go back and get that $10. These were different things. That, and you know, when I look back on it, if, if half of us guys, just half of us guys, had took the advice of the wrestlers, out of the 50s and 60s, we would have been okay in the 80s and 90s. Right. You know, start planning for, you know, and my mom used to say that, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that was my big mistake, uh, one of my mistakes of life. I put all my eggs into working out and wrestling, nothing else. Until later nothing. in life. Right. And then all of a sudden I, I woke up one day and I'm too old to lift the waist and I'm too old to wrestle. Well, not yet. Not yet. Well, well you're on the grand scale. On the grand scale. You're yeah, closer yeah. to the end but, than the know, beginning. You don't, think sure. about, you don't think about these things uh, 
w- while you are young. Right. And, and that's the hardest thing about being a pro wrestler with a lot of kids out there that want to be one. Mm-hmm. There is no retirement. That, that, you know, if you don't save it yourself or prepare it yourself. No one's going to you do it for it, you. And nobody, no, no. You see, like, like if, if you get on a football team, you get some type of pension, you, you get something. And you have a union looking after you. And you have a union looking uh, looking at Doug. I got a buddy, a man, he works for the union, and he been home, uh, and he get uh, $1,500 a week. Wow. It's not a bad payday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so if he get that, if he set home for a year, this guy, was, he go to collect $75,000 a year just sitting home. It's a good payday. So, right, but he never had to take a bump. He never had to wrestle Andre the Giant. He never won any titles. You know, nobody know his name. Just a working he's not man. Famous. He's not famous, but he's sitting home making more money than famous people. You know, money going out, no money coming in for a lot of these wrestlers. It's, it, it's going to be rough because it, it, because of the income. If you make over a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're not going to get none of that stimulus money. Right. Right. Well, it'll be and most of the guys is not incorporated, even though they don't realize now that that uh, uh, their wrestling name uh, is a is a business, not a person. Tony Atlas is a is a is a business. Right. It's not it's not a person. The person is Anthony White. So you say if I was a movie in a the movie, they would say Tony Atlas, Mr. USA, WWE Hall of Famer, played by. Anthony White. Exactly. That's how I would be produced if I was in a movie instead of uh, 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 in the ring. So the younger wrestlers don't realize that until they become old and washed up like me. Well, but, Tony, you, you are a fountain of knowledge. But, but I, I was very, very lucky to become a part of a growing, uh, new, growing organization called Boston Wrestling that have not only kept uh, Tony Atlas out there in the mix, but have did such for people like Aaron Sheik. It was started by Percy Pringle, who all of us know about as Paul Burrow. And, and we had a lot of uh, guests on that, you know, Axe Demolition, you know, uh, Harley Race, uh, who should have had more Harley, but we did it. But Boston Wrestling is, is known all over the legend of uh, legend wrestlers because it's a home for all of us legends. We try. We try. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it had been a home for, for, for legends all over the place. If it wasn't for Boston Wrestling, who would have known how Harley Race really think and feel? Who would have known about X Demolition and, and, and to see him talk about his career over the year? Who would have known about the Aaron Sheet or the Paul Burrow or, or, or Seventh Day? So it keep it keep the old alive, which is the old is really the foundation of, of what is going on now. I agree with you. I think years and decades from now, the stories that are told on these shows, not just by you, but by a lot of the other great guests we have, it's going to be worth gold to fans to be able to enjoy. For better or worse, WWE owns the majority of professional wrestling history. They can do with that whatever they want to. They own it. But at the same time, there's room for non-WWE type programs to tell stories as well. And there's nothing wrong with either one of them. There's nothing wrong with what they do, and there's nothing wrong with what we do. It's great for the business. It is great for the guys. I mean, I don't care who keep keep my legend alive. I don't care if it's WWE or Boston Wrestling. They've been both uh, on my end of the spectrum. We both getting a great service out of it. Well, thank you, Tony. Here we are now, though, 23 minutes into recording, and we haven't even come close to even beginning what we were going to talk about, Tony. And they wonder why well, they, they it, say, Daniel. they I'm say. Ready. Let's get on. Let, I'm, I'm going to show you how ready I am right now. Dan. People Watch say that. I talk over you sometimes. This is the reason why. 23 minutes in, and I haven't even hit the first bullet point. All right, Tony. We mentioned that you're available for all these wide variety of services. We talked about Leo's <laughs> album. Did you hear that? I did not hear that. Okay. All right. Uh, we had a loss in professional wrestling over the weekend, Tony. I'm not sure if you're very familiar with this individual, but we'll see. Wyona Littleheart. Oh, no. Little Wyona Littleheart passed away at the age of 64, Tony. She was one of uh, the fabulous Moolah's girls. She actually helped train Wendy Richter when Wendy Richter was young. Uh, I don't know much about Wyona. I, I think she was pretty much done by the time I started to watch wrestling as a little I guy. I a couple of years back. Yeah. She was at the, uh, the New England uh, uh, Hall of Fame. Wyona Littlehot. Yeah, a couple of years back. 
Do you have any Wyona memories, Tony? No, because you know back in the dim days, uh, the guys didn't really uh, the the what the women they had their own separate dress room. They traveled together. They didn't travel with the boys like they do now. Yeah, you know everything. Well, they was, had their uh, own traveling troop. I see what you're uh, right, yeah. right. But but uh, uh, you know, uh, so the only time that I would see her or talk to her. In fact, I didn't talk to her. The only time I talked to well, Naomi, believe it or not, was a couple of years back um, at the New England Hall of Fame in, in Rhode Island, uh, in Warwick, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. that, that was the only time I ever had a conversation with her because, you know, you couldn't be around the girls wrestlers back right. then. Well, obviously, she was a Indian wrestler with that gimmick. She had almost like a Chief J. Strongbow or Wahoo McDaniel. Uh, do, yep. you have, do you have any memories of her actual wrestling? I, I don't know much about her. Yeah, I have seen. Her. I saw a couple of her matches back in the the seventies and 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 eighties, yeah. late seventies and, and eighties. She was a good wrestler. She back in them days, they wouldn't put you in the ring unless you could wrestle. Moolah really worked That's them over it, good it, before they went on the road. Yeah. No, you would. No, you you would. Uh, they would. Only thing they would put you into probably a battle roar. Yeah. Or they put you into the take bumps or in a squash match or something. Right. But no, no, you wouldn't be on the road. They're not going to pay you if you can't do your job. All right. Wrestling was kind of like it was kind of like construction business. They're not going to hire you to paint the house if you can't paint. Well, to the you just not going to get the job. You know, it was a very, very hard business to get into. They didn't want people into it, and the reason they didn't want people into it, you got to stop and think. You can hear a lot of stories about young kids, like Ronnie Piper told me a story about Freddie Blassett putting the. Uh, uh, toilet paper down in his uh, bagpipes mm -hmm. so he wouldn't blow. Mm -hmm. and, and old Tamils would do stuff like Mr. Fuji to keep you out of it so they could keep their job. They wanted their spot. Right. And a, and a young kid was, was, was definitely a big, big threat to them. Why do you think Chief Day Strong was the largest wrestling, one of the largest wrestling companies in the world, you got this old man bouncing around the ring as an Indian and got all these young, strong an uh, uh, agile Indian that they wasn't even using. That's a good point. Because, yeah, because, because uh, Chief Day Strongbow cut the throat of any Indian. That the, One of the best Indian wrestlers I've ever seen was Wahoo. I think and I would say Wahoo was two, a lot more believer, believable than Chief Jay Strongbow. Yeah, and I would say number two would be Tatanka. To, to but both of them, to me, was a better performer and wrestler than Chief Jay Strongbow. I agree with you. And then Mr. Fuji, I, I remember I, I, I was down in 1988. I remember the year because I was there with Mario Cervoni. I went by the house with, uh, I drew a picture of Tara Tanaka. Mm. In fact, if you get my book, go to crowbarpress.com and get my book. You will see that picture in there. And I gave it to Vince. Uh, to sell at, at his art show at one at, at WrestleMania. But anyway, he told me the story about how Fuji got him out of the WWF at that time. Who did? Um, uh, Toro Tanaka. Oh, Toro Tanaka told you the story. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, what happened? He said that Fuji cut the throat of any Oriental. That's why he was the only Oriental they ever had there before Steamboat came. And all the reason Steve got in there because because uh, Fuji retired from the ring. He was manager. He was yeah. He was transitioning into that managerial role with Don Morocco. Right, but if he was in the ring, Rick and Steve would have never saw New York. Never. Well, I tell that's you, how Tony. He got, and, and, and that's why I tell my story. The only people that I had problem with was black people because they were the only people role uh, uh, position I could take, and all the only. Uh, and, and and I was a threat to their position. Yeah, you know, and that's that's how the old wrestling. So I'm talking wrestling. I'm not talking sports entertainment. Of course, during the nannies with the contracts, and then when when WWE became uh, uh, corporate, uh, they had to go by corporate rules. Right. But the old wrestling, there was no corporate rule. There were no rules, it, and and it was secluded too. That's why Jose was surprised. Uh, but I told the police about him stabbing Brody. It was like I betrayed the business. Yeah. This is between the rest of between the boys. You don't in, involve outside uh, anything. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a, uh, uh, what were you saying? It was just closed knit like that. It was its own inner circle. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's a lot of wrestlers felt that I was wrong 
for telling the police, getting the police involved. If it was anything other than murder, I might agree. But, you know, that, that's yeah, but pushing look at, the... Go yeah, but look at the Slooker. Look at the Slooker incident. Pretty much the same thing. I mean, it, you know, it was shut down. It was, and that's part of a lot of people walking around and knew exactly what happened. Oh, sure, sure. But but it didn't... Nothing went beyond the wrestlers. As I've continued they, to... Yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't want the police involved in nothing. Nothing. They wanted to protect the business. Exactly. They wanted to protect yeah. the business. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tony, I tell you, as usual, we go off track, up, down, all around, and everywhere. I think we covered so much content here. Why not turn it into its own episode so the fans get a bonus this week? So what we'll do is, Tony, we're going to wrap up this episode. Then you and I are going to tape a follow-up. All right, wrestling fans, we didn't expect this one to go all over the place, but then again, we never do. For my sidekick, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, I'm Dan Marotti. Tune in tomorrow for another brand new installment of Wrestling Inside is the podcast with Tony Atlas. And then later this week, we're going to bring you a show that has nothing to do with pro wrestling. It's going to be Tony's look at uh, current events, I guess is the best way to put it. We don't even have a name for it yet. Uh, but until, yeah. we, until we speak again, folks, stay well, stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Good night.